Hey everyone! For this video, I'm going to be using the Week 8 demo that's in Blackboard Part 2 as a continuation. Previously, I had used this file to talk about CSS colors. So before I start talking about this video's content, I'm going to go ahead and open up my HTML, my CSS, and my preview pane. I'll also collapse my Explorer window because we don't need it right now. And because we're going to primarily talk about CSS, I'm going to minimize the amount of screen space my HTML is taking so I can use more room for our CSS and our preview. Okay, that looks good. So we're focusing this time on selectors. Because last time I talked about selectors, I talked about the element selector, the ID selector, class selector, and the descendant selector. But if there's one thing I love more than having a lot of options, it's having a lot more options. So we're going to learn about some more ways to use selectors, starting with what's called a pseudo class selector. Because some elements have states or like states of being. So for example, if you click on a link to change the link's color, or if you hover over something and it changes the text's color or makes a drop shadow, or maybe if you think about the way that the anchor element has different states, such as if you visited a link, if you hover on a link, or if something's happening when you actively click on that link. Well, we can style the different states and we do that with that pseudo class selector. So these are indicated by a colon and that goes immediately after the element's name. So for example, if I said anchor colon hover, then I'm using a pseudo class selector. I'm saying when I'm on an anchor element and I'm hovering over it, whatever I have as my declaration, that's what I want to have happen. Let's say we want to change the color of our links so that they are orange instead of the default blue. Well, by using that pseudo class, when I hover over my links, you can see that they actually turn orange now. There are so many different pseudo classes that we could learn about, and we don't have time to cover them all, but you can learn more about it in the textbook or going to the W3 schools. Now to make the most out of this demo, I'm going to change the background color that I have applied to my document so that I'm not using that cornflower blue. I'm just going to go with no background color. I'm also going to remove that hover and replace it with a property value pair for removing the text decoration or that underline on all of our links. I'm changing my anchor element to have a text decoration of none. So now you can see that all of my links don't have that line underneath them. That's true for all states of their being, whether it's on hover or after we visited the link. We're going to talk about the most common pseudo class selectors, starting with link. Now the syntax for this starts with the anchor element, followed by a colon, and then the actual pseudo class. In this case, we're going to target link. This is going to apply a style to every unclicked or unvisited link that we have. We're just going to change the color from the default blue to a teal color. Next, we're going to look at the visited one. Now this is applying a style to all of the links after we have visited or clicked on them. Again, we're looking at the anchor element, followed by the colon, and then we're going to use the word visited. The default is a purplish color. Well, we're going to change that using an RGB. Now in theory, when I click on a link, it should change the color. But in our preview, that won't work. We're going to need to use a live server to make this happen. Because our preview is constantly refreshing to our most up-to-date changes for every keystroke that we make. So there's never going to be a time where our preview will remember a previous state. So I need to open up my live server to show this working. So each of these links are hyperlinks to different sections in our document. If I click on appetizers, it's going to take me to the appetizers section. Same with main courses and traditional toasts. So I'll go ahead and select appetizers, but then I'm going to need to scroll back up. Now when I scroll back up, you can see it changed that color, indicating that I have visited that link. Keep this in mind when you're working on any of your exercises and your projects. If you're wondering why your visited link's not working, make sure you're looking at it in a live server. Your preview is not going to remember a previous state, whereas your live server will. Okay, the next one is going to be hover. You saw an example of that just a few moments ago, but let's do another one. Again, we're going to use the anchor, the colon, and hover. But this time, I'll do some extra stuff. Let's make the color magenta, but I also want to have a text shadow. And if you haven't had a chance to watch a previous video, when we use text shadow, we're looking at our X position, our Y position, our blur, 
and the color that we want to apply. So on hover, our link should change to magenta, and we should have a drop shadow or a text shadow in the color of gray. So I'll hover over my link to test this out. And now you can see it sort of pops off the page. Let's do another one where we'll set the active and the focus state. Now for these, active means we're applying a style to the element when it's in the process of being clicked. And focus applies a style when the element is selected and ready for keyboard input. I'm going to put this right below my hover. And because I'm going to apply the same style to both elements, I'm going to use a grouped selector. This is like saying anchor on active and anchor on focus. I want to have the font weight of bold. So when I click on a link, notice how it went bold and it applied the hover style? I'll do that again. I'm pressing and holding the key down on my mouse to make that happen. As soon as I release, it then navigates to that location on my page. Now there are so many other pseudo class selectors that are out there. I do encourage you to go out and take a look in your textbook for more of them or to take a look at the W3 schools. Just do a search for W3 and pseudo classes. You'll be able to see the whole list. Now if it wasn't enough that we have more options for selecting things, let's talk about more. Pseudo element selectors. Now there are four selectors that are called pseudo element selectors and they act as though they're inserting this fictional element into the document structure for style. They're indicated in the style sheet by using two colons. You could use a single colon, but I highly discourage using a single colon because we are specifically trying to draw attention to the fact that we're using a pseudo element selector. This is going to be helpful in the future anytime you're trying to look for something, debug something, or do a text search. Now the four pseudo elements are called first line, and this applies a style to the first line of the specified element. First letter applies a style to the first letter of the specified element. And then we have after and before, and those are going to insert content either after or before the specified element. Now there are certain properties that are only available for first line and first letter, and if you want to know more, go ahead and take a look at the textbook out there. It's in chapter 13. Let's take a look at an example. We're going to style the first letter of our H2 element to be a lot bigger than it is right now. But we only want to target the first letter, and we don't want to add a span in our HTML to accomplish this. So our syntax is going to be h2 for the selector, followed by two colons. That indicates pseudo element, and then first dash letter. And now all we have to do is specify what it is that we want to do. I want to change the font size to be 2.3 m's. That looks pretty cool. We can do extra to make it stand out just a little bit more. Let's change the font family for just that first letter to make it look more handwritten or cursive. And because I'm adding another declaration to my selector, I need to make sure I'm using a declaration block by breaking them out to different lines. Let's just use the generic font family of cursive. That looks pretty cool. All right, the last type of selector we're going to talk about is an attribute selector. This selector is going to target an element based on its attribute. So for this, I'm going to really need to show a lot more of my HTML to talk about it. I'm going to reduce my preview pane so that we can see the HTML very well. I'm also going to scroll my HTML up a little bit so that we can see more of our content at one time. Let's walk through a couple of examples. If you look in our HTML, we have a lot of class attributes. There's a class for price. There's a class for new item. Up at the top, we have a class for label. And down at the bottom, we have a class for warning. So we have a lot of different class attributes. Let's target every single element that has a class attribute and turn them all red. Now our syntax for using a class attribute is to start with square brackets. Then we're going to specify which attribute we're targeting. In this case, we're targeting the class attribute. Now this is really important because we're not saying which of the four classes that we're talking about. We're just saying any attribute that's a class. Now when we add our curly brackets, and we add our property value pair, let's say color red, we're going to target a lot of different elements. Class equals price, class equals label, class equals warning, class equals new item, it doesn't matter. They're all gonna turn red. That gets pretty powerful for us. 
Now we can get more specific and preface our selector with an element. Let's say, for example, we didn't want to target every single element with a class in it. Maybe we only wanted to target any span element with a class in it. So we would just put span in front of it. Now this is the equivalent of saying all of my span elements that have a class attribute need to be turned to the color red. Let's do another one. I'm going to collapse the entrees section and I'm going to collapse the dessert section. I'll also collapse my footer and that reduces the amount of code that we're looking at just so I can demonstrate what I'm looking for. Now in this case, let's say we want to style all of the vegan choices on our menu. Now we could add a class selector to each of them, but there's an easier way to do that because we have the title attribute that's already being used in our markup. The same way we did it with a class selector, we'll do it with a title. We're going to need those square brackets to indicate that this is an attribute selector. We'll put the attribute inside, in this case title, our curly brackets, and then we're going to say which color. Let's turn them fire brick. Uh-oh, this changed some of the text in our header section since that also had a title attribute. Let's scroll up and take a look. It sure did. See where it says welcome? No worries, we can fix that. We'll modify our title attribute selection. So we're only selecting the title attributes with a very specific value. In doing this, we can say exactly which titles. So inside of our square brackets, right after title, we'll put in the equal sign. We'll put in quotes. And then we're going to specify what value we're looking for. In this case, we only want to target the title where the value is equal to vegan selection. So you'll notice that our header is no longer applying that style to the title attribute. We could make this even simpler and choose any element that starts with vegan in our title attribute. So rather than typing in all of that, we can add an additional modifier. We'll use the caret symbol to say, I only want to select the title attributes where the value starts with vegan. This little modifier is an additional item that we have. We can indicate whether we want something that starts with a value, contains a value, ends with a value. Lots of different options, so make sure you're checking that out in our textbook. I've got one more thing I'm going to throw out today. That's background images. Unlike images, background images use CSS. I'm going to open up that Explorer window and I'm going to close out my HTML because I don't want to see it right now. And then I'll open up my images folder and notice we have two images. There's a purple dot and a plaid. If I select the image, you can see it's just one instance of a plaid background. If I select the purple dot, same thing, one instance of a purple dot. I'll close that out. We're going to use that plaid image as our background on our page. And we're going to need to do it from the CSS. So in my body element, I'm going to add another property value pair, this time for background image. And I'm specifically referring to a URL, so I need to pass in the actual location based on where I am right now. Well, I'm currently in the Style Sheets folder, so before I can go into the Images folder, I'm going to need to leave the Style Sheets folder. So that takes me out of the Style Sheets folder, and now I can see the Images folder. My forward slash lets me look into that Images directory. Now I can see those two images. I specifically want the plaid one, so I'm going to select it. Here's a couple of things that I want to talk about for tips. Make sure you keep a background color in your body element even though your image is going to override it. We do this in case the image fails to load. That color will still show up. And remember, not everyone uses images or sees images on their end. That's something that they can disable. So I'm going to add a background color and I'll set it to linen. Even though you can't see it, it's good to have it there. Okay, now the menu text is a little harder to read. Let's add a background color to the main element and then give it a little bit of opacity to help us out. Quick note, before you add selectors to your page, make sure you're scrolling through your list of selectors to determine if you already have one out there. If I already have a main selector, I don't want to add a second one. So I'll scroll through my styles and it doesn't look like I have one yet, so I'll go ahead and add one. First, I'll set the background color. Next, I'll add a little opacity. And because my content is really squished up against the edge, I want to add a little bit of padding. We'll talk more about padding and margins coming up, but for now, we're just going to add the padding property with 1M for the value. That does look a lot cleaner. Okay, let's do another one. Let's add the purple dot to the header. 
And because I want to make sure I'm not adding an additional header, I'll scroll through and make sure I don't have any headers. I do have a header selector out there, so I'll just add to it. I'm going to set my background image. I'll set the URL. I do have to leave the style sheets folder again, going into the images folder, forward slash, there's my images. I'm going to select purple dot, but notice what happens. That's okay, we can fix it. Because we have the ability to restrict our tiling to repeat on either just the X axis, on the Y axis, to have it repeat or to not repeat. By default, the background repeat is already set to repeat. So we'll put in background repeat. We're going to repeat on just the X axis. So it's repeat dash X and now it's repeating just across the top. We could also choose to have it repeat vertically by using the Y axis. In fact, let's take a look. Or if we don't want the image to repeat at all, we would use the value no repeat. And we just get a single instance of that image. I kind of like the repeat on the X axis the most, so I'll put that back. Now that's it for this video, but if you have any questions on any of this content, please don't hesitate to ask.